Start recording on OBS. I'm going to hit start streaming now. Hello again. Thank you for downloading, watching, and listening to the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together to take uh, various uh, jaunts, walks, perambulations around these topics that tend to bubble up when we embark on this adventure of communicating visually. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Hi, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I am a user experience and game designer, and uh, yeah, make some podcasts, like here with you, Jersey. What's going on? I think you describe our show really well. Do you, ha there's this poetic thing where like you do this hook, like, well, you know, we do a walk around a topic and mm -hmm. then you at the end often say, I think we took a walk around that. And it's, <laughs> it really hit me the other day when I was listening to a show. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I, I didn't even notice that I was doing that sandwiching. I, that's, that's just the teacher in me probably, right? Mm. Um, well, nice work. Oh, thanks. Uh, so, I mean, anybody who's watching this as it streams live knows this, but anybody who might be listening to the audio afterwards or even watching the video on YouTube afterwards may uh, not know that we're this week, we're finally taking the leap and trying to start streaming on twitch.tv from now on. Uh, well, for now, right? Because, uh, well, why would we do such a thing, Rob? We're not gamers. We're not going to do st streaming of uh, Halo 2, Diablo. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> I'm going to show my ignorance of video games right in the platform where everybody watches video games. That's great. Way to go, Jersey. Way to alienate yourself from the crowd. Well, it's okay. We're, we're, uh, we're owning this alienness and the, the, the differences. It's like, yeah, I've been a, like a, probably a lifelong gamer. I encountered the Atari 2600 as a young child and have, you know, been pretty attached to and interested and fascinated and eventually started building games. So, you know, yeah, we're also into this, but like the Twitch thing it's a different element. It's this whole social um, performing with your passion and other people are with you here too, kind of performing with you. Even the, And so it's like, it's really a different thing. Like we've had chat on our show, but they, it's a pretty, pretty much um, almost like a back channel where folks would comment and question along the way where chat on Twitch can go like, pretty much be like another like member of the show's like cast or what have you right i mean it's it depending it depends right so we're obviously starting out slow and experimenting and learning so you know we're here to do that we're here to you know keep our show streaming to where where people watch stuff and probably put it on with us as our you know often what i think the role that we play is uh we are of uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, not to brag, but we're pretty friendly and thoughtful and <laughs> we, you know, we're, we're, we're nice companions as you, as you make stuff or think about stuff or drive or, you know, do the dishes or whatever. So yeah, that's the kind of stuff we do. And, and it happens to be like Jersey said, all about like that, like we make a variety of different things and we un unpack it and explore and we try to do like a practical side of things and we try to do a little bit more, uh, philosophical and, and ask why and how too. So, and as, as a, uh, a follow-up note to the folks who have been watching our streams live on YouTube over the years, um, we're making this choice partially out of necessity, uh, and, and apologies to those of you who got, you know, really comfortable and used to commenting via YouTube while we stream live. Uh, the, the software they use for that is changing and, uh, you know, we, we can't continue to do the show the way we had been. And so we thought it was a good opportunity to start trying out some other technologies and some other platforms, which this is us modeling what we talk about in the show all the time is iterating, experimenting, hypothesizing and testing. Right. I think I got those out of order, but you get the idea. OK, so uh, what? No, that's great. I mean, uh, it's it's uh, yeah, I, I'm i with you all the way. Let's um, well, I mean, here we go. We're tackling our first uh Lean into art cast. We've we've done hundreds of these, right? And and uh, you know we'll we'll talk more about like kind of like this this other show that we do for our patrons and stuff. 
uh, who knows? Like trying new platforms, new mechanisms might come up and wait, you know, we'll keep you posted. So, mm-hmm. and uh, can't wait to, to jump into this topic. I don't know. It's kind of a, an interesting topic to, uh, to, to go to a new crowd and you talk about mm-hmm. like, hey, everybody, rejection. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let me, let me hit some music so, to take us there. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, and go you're not going to hear it because we're still playing with our setup, but. For those who are listening to the audio, you got your cue that we are now in the first part of the show. And yeah, um, this this topic came up in some other discussions I was having with some other people, but uh, and also like in in my own career, um, I had recently been working to pursue a few leads and did a lot of work to get there. And when I got there, I was told, "Yeah, this is really good, but no, not what we're looking for." And it got me talking with some other cartoonists and artist friends of mine where, you know, we were kind of, um, we were reflecting on the fact that visual storytelling, making things in a spirit of service and making stuff in general, that line that you could call it career, you could call it pursuit, you call it hobby. What I, I use the word endeavor because I think that encompasses all encompasses both like hobby and career because you're applying time to this thing and you're in pursuit of something um it asks a lot of you because it's very attractive to these very sensitive souls who like i have something inside me that i want to share with the world i have this way of looking at things that i really want to share with the world but in order to do it you have to expose yourself to this enormous tidal wave of rejection right and everybody's got that story of like all of the rejected premises pitches and and uh, submissions and samples that you've sent to different organizations or publishers or or groups before you finally got that in, right? Everybody has that story, but um, it doesn't take away from the fact that rejection kind of (laughs) sucks. You know, so like, I, I wonder if we start with like if we accept the fact that, okay, if, if you're going to go on this path, you're probably going to get rejected a lot. There are some people who don't, right? There's some people, like, there is a luck element to this thing, right? Um, right place, right time, and maybe you get an early break. Um, there are examples of that. Uh, but for, I would say, the majority of people, there's, and I've known people who are even award winners, very successful projects, and they still, their next thing, they go to bat and you know, nobody really wants to take a bite at that thing. Maybe it's just a little bit, it's, they don't quite get it. It doesn't, see, it doesn't make sense to them right now, despite all this trust you built, right? So for a lot of us, rejection is going to be part of it. So what does that look like? And I thought maybe to like build my case, I could take us through, like I could tell a little story of this journey to like talk about all the effort you put in to land on rejection. Then we can talk about what rejection like look, looks like for us. What do you think? That's, that sounds like a great, uh, uh, great progression. Okay. So you start out, you're making things in the spirit of some kind of service. Like you have an audience that you want to make something for. I just as cases in point, right? Like, so I make comics primarily for elementary grade kids. Um, Rob makes games and you do UI UX design. And so that's, for, you know, games are for players. There's somebody who's going to use this thing and UI UX is for users. It's in the name, right? There's somebody who's going to use the thing you're making, right? Mm -hmm. So in doing this, like I'm going to make comics for kids. You're going to make uh, user experiences for users or you're going to make games for gamers. We have to do perspective taking. We have to think about, well, who is the person I'm trying to make this thing for and what does their world look like? So when I'm making comic stories for young people, especially with like the Captain Seriously project that I do, you know, there's a different book per grade that gets released. So therefore, I have to every year meet with uh, faculty at the school to say, okay, what are the second graders going through this year? What are the third graders going through this year? Whichever year I'm working on. And they give me a lot of input. Like, what are they doing? What are they, like, what kind of problems have you noticed that they're experiencing? What kind of developmental things do you want them to level up? And then I capture all that information and put it into, so this is like, this is research that we do. And then it's also digging into my own personal experiences. What do I remember about third grade? What was hard about it? What was easy about it? Um, What was fun about it? What what was scary about it? All those kinds of emotional things. And then there's also like firsthand research, like field research. Like I work with kids all the time in my classroom. So I'm constantly observing their interactions and their behaviors. And I'm I'm observing what kinds of... uh, 
difficulties they run into with the lesson plans I create, right? And you've done like applied research in UI UX design, right? You've gone out and interviewed people. Oh yeah, lots of it. I mean, it's, I mean, different kinds of, um, there's sort of a, you can have different intentions when you, when you go out and when you're trying to learn something. I mean, research is just a mechanism to have more confidence to make a decision. And so you, you might need to, um, well, maybe you finish something or you have a version of something you want to put it in someone's hands and see if it's, if it's really fit to the task. And one of the best ways to do that is honestly something like usability testing and getting, uh, getting a chance to maybe even talk and discuss along the way. And as long as you're, you're not asking leading questions and um, making people feel like they're being tested as opposed to the, to the thing is really what's, what's the, the object of concern and, and, uh, and, and investigation, uh, you can get good information, especially if you do it a few times. And uh, let's see, what does Jared Spool say about like research? Because there's all sorts of myths and stuff. And I've helped spread some of the myths like, oh, you need to ask about five people and then you're probably statistically good. And turns out that's not really, you know, whatever. Welcome to turns out universe. And uh, so uh, Jared Spool has a neat heuristic where he's like, uh, what, research until you um, no longer astonished about what you're learning. <laughs> Something like that. He's like principle of least astonishment. He has a cool title for it. But um, yeah, I've done, I've done lots of research and uh, it's, yeah, you're, you're the, what you find is, with is this, this matchmaking of like, well, did I think the right thing? Did I put it in the right form? Is it presented in the right way? And is, you know, and every one of those things could be um, uh, mistaken. And, and that also sounds like a lot of work, right? Like research until you're no longer, how did it go? Research, research until you're no longer astonished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean that already, I mean, you've just, you've, you've served up a big bowl of work for me to do. Right. Um, so you do all that work, all that thinking, all that planning, all that, all that thoughtful analysis, research and observation. And now it's time to you draft your hypothesis, time to apply your skills. All right, so now you're going to do, you know, different iterations of the thing that you're making, whether it's a game or whether it's a book. You do different drafts and you get feedback from all the stakeholders and you revise it some more. And maybe maybe that really great joke that you liked gets cut. Maybe a line that you wrote that you thought had a lot of like poetic, uh, like semiotic cohesion in your story uh, gets told by an administrator. No, you're not running with that line. That's inappropriate for our students. I'm like, yeah, but I'm just trying to shoot above their heads just so they get them to reach me. Nope, that's not that's not the place or nor time for that. Oh, okay, right. There's a little bit of like tensions and back and forth. Um, and maybe it, through this iteration, you also have to level up. Like, uh, and this is something you've reported when making games. It's like you start out with this premise or this platform or this technology, and you realize that, well, you know, to, in order to do the thing I want to do, in order to stay lean and not have to hire out a whole bunch of uh, people, right? You have to change the entire approach to the thing. I mean, you've told the story in the past, mm -hmm. very recently. <laughs> so, and then. Uh, and so it, it, you go through all these different drafts, all all this the skill leveling up and all this problem solving as you make the thing. And now you got the thing. And then there's one more step yet. Now you got to present it to the audience. You got to present it to the world or you got to present it to a potential buyer. Right. Uh, maybe you're making just enough of a thing that it's like a pitch for a publisher or a pitch for, um, you know, an employer, software development company, et cetera. And now. You have to figure out wh whatever audience you're presenting it to. Now you got to come up with language that summarizes the thing to sell the vision of the thing that you've spent all this time working on, that you've th been this close to. You've been an inch away from for how long now? And now you got to back up and go like, well, what is, how do I make this, how do I draft language? And this is one of the parts I hate the very most. It's like, how do I write prose to describe the thing that I've brought into this world, right? And then you have to sit and wait for the response. So that's a lot of investment. And this is all to say, this is all for this is my build up to say like it is not surprising that rejection would hurt after all that investment in something. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the I think it's pretty reasonable to be attached to to what you make. Um 
it's a theme I've encountered a variety of times in, in formal and informal conversations throughout my career, uh, really believing in something and having it not go where I thought it could go. Um, and, and a lot of times meeting some kind of rejecting end. It's, it's hard, super hard because I've, you, you you hear advice like oh you know kill your darlings is the what, what a horrible metaphor that is but like people in writing that's a that's they they bite they bust that one out quite a bit and they're not wrong I don't like the framing of it I don't like the feeling of it um, because it's hard you get you get attached to your ideas and I push back on the the idea that you're not supposed to hurt <laughs> because where the heck else are you going to find the meaning, the meaning and um, resonance with what you create if you don't care? So anyway, like that's, that's the yeah. hard thing. So like I, I, what I'm saying, it's, I think it's understandable for rejection to hurt. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree. And, and that, that was why I wanted to like, you know, take back up and walk through all of that to get to the part where you get rejected. And then I thought maybe to, to, as far as structure of the show, maybe what we could do is spend, you know, like five, 10 minutes just talking about like really try to commiserate and as honestly as we can, can express what it feels like for us when we encounter that rejection. And then maybe in the second half, do the reframing that you were starting to get to there when you're talking about like, Hey, this is a signal that you care about something. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think, I think that's the beginning of the reframing, but I don't think that's, that's the full reframing. Oh, that, it's that, totally not. It's totally not. Yeah. I mean, because there's so much to these mechanics where like even seeing like there's this buildup to where you're, uh, I mean, you're, you're just getting attached. It's like saying I'm going to, um, host a pet for a while, but it's just business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Probably going to love it after, you know, when it needs There's to. a lot of buddy films that were built on that premise, right? <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's like you spend enough time with something. Yeah, you're going to care about it. Um, So, you know, it's like uh, I, I even went through this when I was working on some pitches uh, earlier this year. And... I thought I solved the problem very elegantly. And I, and I actually captured this in um, a Fabulous Secrets episode, which you can get to through my Patreon, patreon.com slash jersey. But um, it was, I, I came up with what I thought was a very clever solution to get a pitch developed very quickly. And it also got me very excited about the project again, because I, not only did I find a quick solution, but it found an approach to doing a graphic novel that I found very appealing. Sent it to my agent, sent it to some trusted friends, all the feedback I got was like, no, I don't think that's going to work. I don't think editors are going to like that. Th that structure that you did is like, I could see why it'd be appealing to you, but I don't think it's going to be appealing to anybody else. And my first reaction was just like totally like a 10 year old kid whose birthday party got ruined. I'm like I'm kicking dirt and I'm like swearing at the ground. You know, it's like, no, rah, rah, rah. Uh, like, why can't they see that? It's, that it's awesome. You know, and I threw this total ego temper tantrum. I not at anybody nobody was in the room but it was just me like pouting and being really petulant for like a couple hours right and then i calmed down and i realized okay there's a, if they're all saying it they must be onto something let me look at what they said now without getting so emotionally reactive to it but yeah like when when i face that kind of friction or that kind of thumbs downing to something that i'm really excited about um from people who even want to help me like these are people who really want me to succeed right <laughs> Um, my reaction can be like very personal. I can get very defensive and very angry. And, uh, I don't know what, what kind of emotions run through your veins when you're, uh, when you come against that kind of friction, because I mean, you've worked in a lot of different environments with a lot of different teams and I'm sure you've like presented like, here's a cool solution. And there was like, no. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, I, the, the only problem is picking which one. Uh, to really th to think about and, and, you know, keeping appropriate professional boundaries and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even in private, it's not like I'm going to say, uh, I don't know, uh, stuff you would read in like a scandal blog or something. Right. It just, it, it's no, just, I'm not, I'm not asking for you to go through that. Right. And, and not, I'm not, not that you, you weren't doing that either. It's just, you know, I, I think 
I'm just I'm just interested in the, the feelings that you felt, not about like the specific instances. Like I I just brought those up just to give you the trigger. Say like, okay, put yourself in that space. What goes through your head when somebody says no? Nah. Uh it's it's really I, I I feel like a cartoon character who has a uh, has this this little thought balloon above their head and it's like this is where I'm going I'm going to the land of victory and it's going to be so awesome and now it's then it just shatters and falls all around me and I'm like <laughs> I would I how do I even process and make sense that like this thing is not going forward um, my yeah. life was this forward right. And I, uh, it's, it's, it's hard. And then, then I start, I feel terrible and I start journaling and I don't know, angry. And it's sometimes. almost like, depends, right? Depends. Cause the sometimes the audience, I mean, they're the, sometimes your audience is the, the one that's like really want you to succeed and what have you. And then it's just kind of like, I let them down and, mm. and I'm like, ah, can I, why, why did I let them down? And I didn't learn enough to make this work. I love learning and I love helping. How did I not learn enough to make this work? That's so funny, right? Because it's like, it's also especially difficult because it's something that you enjoy doing so much. And when you spend time leveling up at it to the point where you can look at it and be like, hey, I'm not disgusted by what I put down on the page. I'm not disgusted by what I'm making. It's, it's actually turning into something that I think, I mean, I know I'm not objective, but I think this is pretty good. And then to have it not land and have somebody reject it or say, no, it's not good enough. It's how can you not take that personally? Because it's something that you ex you experience joy when you're doing it. And it's something that you've invested a lot of yourself into. And it's something that when, when you feel a lot of joy for something and when you invest your, yourself a lot into something, it is absolutely reasonable that you would find yourself identifying with that thing more and more, right? <laughs> such a trap but yes yeah it is i mean like we we know we shouldn't do it but it's it, i see how that can happen it's it seems absolutely uh perfectly a reasonable thing to do um and even the way we talk about ourselves like i'm a cartoonist and teaching artist right like that's what i lead with that's my identity and so on um i also think like you said like letting people down i think that's another really big one like i showed up in the spirit of service to do this thing and people were like yeah but the thing you're doing isn't really serving anybody oh Wow. Yeah. The, the, all the, all the, the connection with the audience is part of that too, because it wasn't just me going to the land of victory. We were all going to this land of victory. Yeah. And I'm like, the, okay, I, the, the bus is broken down. Maybe there was never a bus in the first place. We can't get on it. I don't know what to say to everybody. Yeah. That's, and yeah. And, and the more, um, lizard brain part of my my psyche will also say like oh here's the land of awesome that we're headed towards and then when they pop that balloon or smash it to piece i'm like you took away my land of awesome why did you take away my land of awesome right <laughs> i had it it was right there i'm pointing to it you took that away why are you taking that from me right like and, and in the process if your process included involving the people who took it yeah. away and then it's just like why did you do that to all of us like yeah you yeah. were going there too and so yeah it's hard like the 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 um the meaningfulness through the relationships and the learning and the co-creating and it it's it's like and, and so that right it's 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 a really fun process hard to not get it detached yeah and then i'll also think things like I put so much time into this. That's time I could have been doing on something that would have been more successful, right? Uh, and that's that's a whole funny trap we can get to in the second half, right? It's like the the the, the what is that? The um, sunk cost fallacy, right? Like I put this much work into it, I might as well see it all the way through. Well, that could have been work I put someplace else. Um, Very much, maybe. So. That it's it, yeah, it's hard to. Um you feel like I mean, and it is some kind of opportunity cost, but where what world, what reality exists without opportunity cost? So how, I, I, I don't see the, you know, the trade that could be made there. Um, you're my, reminding me of this thing where it's like, how many keystrokes do I have left? Mm. <laughs> really what, 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 where is that from? Uh, it was uh, just a, uh, a friend and colleague was like, hey, check this out. <laughs> How many key strokes do I have left? This is and a website? It's a website. Oh, yeah. It's keysleft.com. 
Yep. So how old are you? How fast do you type? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brutal. <laughs> it's so brutal. <laughs> And so that leads me to this, this this thought that goes through my head sometimes, too, is that like the more and I'm less guilty of this now than I was, say, when I was in my 30s. But this idea of suck it up, rub some dirt on it, get back in there. Right. Because like this is part of the this is part of the deal. You know, you signed on to this. And if, if you're not hurting, then you're not in the game. You know, and it's like, well, that that doesn't feel like the most healthy place for my brain to be all the time, at least for me. <laughs> Um, and I, and I was thinking of, I, I, I can't remember if I talked about this in the Lena Tart cast around fabulous secrets, but I was, um, going to a Clippers game recently, the baseball team here in Columbus. And I saw a guy crossing the street and he had a, a, a Nike shirt and said, pain is power. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, or no, it's like, no, no pain, no power. That's what it was. It was, it was like a, a play on. Hey, it was a play on no pain, weird. no gain, but no pain, no power. Like, I get the idea behind it, but it was just like equating those two the way that was. And it's got alliteration. It's just like, oh, I don't know. I, I don't. On the one hand, it's like, yeah, pain is part of the deal. But on the other hand, it's like, ooh, we could easily cross a line into like glorifying that whole idea of, you know. Um, How about this? So, uh, no pain, no power, but pain isn't the point. <laughs> That would be the back of the shirt. <laughs> yeah. Pain is incidental. <laughs> All right. Um, so, yeah, I think, do you feel like we like, f- like set up, the, the teed up the ball to say like, yep, this hurts. We've explained why it's reasonable that it hurts. We've explained that we are fellow human beings who experience this hurt and these somewhat rational, somewhat irrational thoughts about the hurt. Do you want to take a break and then talk about reframing it? Mm. I think we, I think we can. Uh, I'm going to tease one more. It's like mm. uh, the, the, the solo aspect I think is pretty well covered in what we've said so far, but there's, mm. there's a little bit of the, um, you know, you're probably depending on what you're making, uh, you know, consulting or, you know, full-time somewhere or a part of a bigger team or whatever. There's a, there's an element of, different people having the different reactions all at the same time. Mm. I, I just okay. maybe just quick touch on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we'll do that in about a minute and 30 seconds. Uh, but first we have to thank some people who make this show possible. And those people are the folks who support us on Patreon. Yes. Patreon.com slash lean into art is the website. What is it? It is a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you believe in me and Rob and you believe in what we do, you can say, Hey, here's a dollar a month, as little as a dollar a month. And you could, uh, help make the show more sustainable. I want to thank five people who've been doing exactly that. First up, India Swift. Thank you, India. Phenomenal animator. You can find her work on Twitter at Old Swifty. Also, Kelly Ishikawa. Thank you, Kelly, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Kelly on Twitter at Kelly of Ishikawa. And Nate Marcel. Thank you, Nate. You can find Nate on Twitter at Great Sea Monster. And Alexander Steenhorse. Thank you, Alexander, for believing in us and what we do. And finally, Catherine Sugru. You can find Catherine on Twitter at Cat with a K S O O G R O O Cat Sue Grew. And you can join them at patreon.com slash lean into art where you will find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record in between or, well not in between, we record them like monthly just for people who support us on Patreon. And those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want with your fellow leaners. And uh there are also episodes where we just kind of riff out an idea. It's like Rob and me working out in the intellectual dojo. And once again, that's patreon.com slash lean into art. Thank you to everybody who supports us there. It means a lot to us. It sure does. What an awesome signal to get. Um, now, this thing I teased, and I mean, I mm-hmm. mean to keep it brief because you know, okay. this awesome outline, but like, uh, it's an interesting dynamic. So now imagine you were in the situation, Jersey, where uh, it was the, the rejection is a project that you were working on together and you had different hats and different roles and the, and the, uh, um, or maybe that was part of it too. Maybe you, you know, the, the thing you're describing was the, was a team thing. And, and it's interesting to me how different people can have different reactions, like before, during, and after the whole, um, rejection. 
So like what kinds of reactions? So I think some of it is like, I know we're going to, we're going to talk about framing and reframing. Right. And I think some folks go into that, that endeavor with an expectation of like, well, don't, and they really try to live in the don't get attached mode. Mm -hmm. I think some people pull it off and it's just, they're, they're wired in a, in that way and it works for them. Yep. And, um, then, and so now imagine being on a project that got, you know, you handle it the way we describe handling it. And you're also alongside someone who's like, eh. <laughs> yeah. And then one of the framings that, that, that I, I was, I heard it described and I like having the conversations. I like understanding my collaborators very much. It's just, uh, it's interesting. These, these metaphors, like someone just once described to me, don't hold your projects in front of your heart, hold them, hold them off to the side. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I bet that's functional for some folks. Um, yeah. but I can't necessarily do that and feel like me, you know? And, and mm -hmm. so it's part of, it's like, you know, for some folks they're like, they want to get into the intellectual thing and be like, Oh, you see it differently or whatever. And some folks are like, Nope, just over here. <laughs> And so that's just kind of interesting to, to go through that. Another aspect of it is some folks who, you know, are different points in their, their, their career or experience, they may feel way worse than you. Uh, and then all of a sudden you're in the situation where you can go through a hard thing together and you can kind of tend and befriend. And, and, uh, and that, that's pretty powerful. I've, I've been on teams that, that have uh, like kind of adapted in that way. Way and 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 didn't just pick up in a, in the like suck it up buttercup kind of way and but like um we're sincerely ready to try again you know and that's mm -hmm. I, that's a pretty cool thing to be a part of yeah yeah that is one of one of the upsides of working with a team right is that those kinds of moments can happen because yeah you're right not everybody's not everybody's motivations are perfectly aligned even if they're parallel or even if they're harmonious they're never necessarily perfectly aligned and not everybody's there um on the same emotional operating in the same emotional space like you said like the the your level of attachment may vary um yeah <laughs> uh, and and this i mean even on projects where i work alone I have a network of friends who I rely on to talk about this, basically like, you know, be the pillow I can scream in for a little bit and then help me <laughs> they can tend to befriend me. <laughs> and then I can do the same for them, right? Um, so yeah. Uh, so let's talk about like, how do we reframe the, these feelings and to make this manageable, find the utility and maybe uh, find a... Um, more healthful perspective on this whole relationship we have with the stuff we make and the audience or people who use it. Um, Do you want to go first? No, you because okay. you you kind of you you kind of let us off a little bit in the yeah. earlier half of the show with this thought about like meaning. I think the the okay. So if you think of you know your work is is just step take it take a step back from this piece of work and think of your body of work and how there is a learning and a progression and there's meaning in that uh you will take other messages and things from uh from how this ended how did it end why did it end um this is a chance to get to do research and what um you know what do you want to do with that with what you learned um, there's, cause some of it might be leading to a, like, to a, like a change or you want to do things in a new way, uh, maybe a new audience or something about it. There, there's information there uh, in amongst, um, the, the tough feelings. And, uh, that I think if you pick up some of that, you're going to certainly connect with the, the meaning of this work. And you can even look back at, at maybe even multiple different things if our, that succeeded or failed and, and um, you know, see a bigger picture too. So it's like small meaning and big meaning. You, you once described, and I, I found this, this, this language so useful is you described that an emotion is a signal, right? Um, and and what, what that does, what it did for me when you described it that way is that it mean, it meant that I'm not the emotion, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> because it's like when you're feeling big feelings, it feels like you are the entire emotion and that can make it hard to process and think straight. Um, so when I'm feeling that frustration, I can say, okay, well, one, this frustration means that I'm engaging with something that is very meaningful to me, which hooray, let's celebrate that for a second, even if it doesn't assuage or uh, dull the pain, you know? And then, okay, well, the frustration means that I've hit some kind of stumbling block. Now it's time to look for, is there any useful information in this? Uh, is there any useful information in what's happening around me to help me f not be frustrated about this thing or to overcome or solve this problem? And that, that gets me thinking about critiques, which we've talked about in the past, this idea that, like, I can take very, <laughs> I don't think Dan Mishkin would mind me saying this out loud. He described my prose as passable. It was passable prose. And I remember he, he, he couched it very lovingly with all this other language about how much he enjoys my work. But he just, when he said that about my prose, I was like, I said, yep, yep, that, that is precisely true. And what's more is because he had a lot of information as to what I was doing um, that made my prose passable instead of excellent, um, I was very grateful for that, for that critique, right? Whereas if you suck, you know, it's like, well, there's no good information in that. <laughs> I have your opinion and that's great that you can express yourself so freely, but that helps me exactly zero, you know, because I, I how, how do I suck? In what way do I suck? What, what specific thing am I doing that would make, could I, that I could stop doing or what new thing could I start doing that would make me suck a lot less, you know? Um, so is this is this rejection uh, when it happens, it, I like to then, if I can, follow up and say, okay, so you don't like it. What's one thing I could do different? Um, that's that's like my go to almost every time. It's like, okay, let's just narrow it down. Let's narrow it down to one thing, especially if I'm like getting lots of different sources of information. Like, so if I'm taking it to Dan, taking a project to this person, that person, what's one thing you would do differently, you know? and then collect that information. That would be helpful to help iterate the thing, you know, if I choose to iterate it. Um, or is it something, like in the case of, when we talked about that last stage, the presentation of the idea, maybe it's the way you're talking about it. Maybe it's the way you're describing it. That like So here you have Guitar Fretter, this wonderful app game that you made years ago, nine years ago, and recently celebrated with a, a Twitch stream of your own. Um, like, is it the game itself that isn't uh, connecting or is it the way it's presented? Is it your website? Is it the language that you use? Is it the way you talk about it to people, right? Um, maybe that's part of the rejection, getting that information, right? That's something I've been puzzling out lately is like with this, this uh, project that didn't go where I wanted it to go. I thought, well, is it the project or is it the language I used to describe the project? Did I not sell the vision of what this thing could be, right? Yeah, and hopefully uh, through uh, maybe, I know I might be misusing the term, but like triangulation, get multiple sources, uh, you know, find your cool headed space to, you know, look at what you can, look at what you can and uh, make, make the most of the information. People are funny. So if someone is, yeah, this is where, so when you're doing research, I mean, try to get, just get as much observational evidence as you can. The, the, uh, the, the, the description and critique is, is useful, but like, hopefully there's more, more that you can get to. Uh, that's where it's like putting a product in, in, in market and seeing how, uh, what, you know, when it gets adopted or not and getting other feedback as far as it's it just anything you can get from, from the data. And, uh, it's, it's, it's good because people are funny. Cause I've, I've received rejections like, um, where, the the pres let's see the decision maker wasn't the presenter of the information right so i presented a rejection but that person didn't have the information where it's like oh, yeah how do i how do i learn more from this it's like well you you may you may not so then you need to, you need to deal with the, the gap of available information yeah. um, maybe figuring out a way to to explore it if you choose to because um, it may, and and it, it, there may be no way to explore it in that prior arrangement, right? So you had this conversation and it ended in a, in a way where you can't get the data and then it's just time to try like a new experiment, basically. 
um, presenting the project to a new audience and, and maybe in a new way to try to not, you know, have another gap at the, you know, wherever, if should this one end in a rejection as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shopping around to different audiences. And then, and then, then comes, uh, at least in projects that I've done in the past, another round of research, right? Okay. So that didn't land. Let me look at this audience and what they're consuming and what they're enjoying, right? What, what needs are they fulfilling with the other stuff that they're purchasing, consuming, or, you know, using, right? And can my existing thing be adapted to meet them halfway over there? Or is, is, it, is the, the service that my thing has, I meet that, but I'm not making it apparent to them somehow right um and that's that's more that's that's just more uh analysis and testing that has to go on which can sound like a real drag right but um i think it's it's the part of i mean i'm going to use this language a lot in the next couple of minutes it's a part of loving a thing in my experience um and then then we get to another question is supposing like have you ever had a situation where the rejection meant that you just went well you know what i did what i could with it dust my hands, let this thing go up, sit on the shelf or, you know, end it. Yeah. Because I mean, so we're talking about in a way like a gateway decision maker rejection where it's sort of a, you're building toward this, um, like an event where a, a, a commitment needs to happen and it will change the, what happens next on the project. This could be a Kickstarter too, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But that, but yeah, something with the threshold. Yeah. And because, uh, which is a kind of constraint, but there are other constraints that can stop a project, right? Where, uh, you can discover a new technical limitation. You can discover, um, like in the early in guitar fretters history, when, uh, I found that, that the prototype that I made didn't run on the target platform. Uh, and that was, uh, pretty, that was difficult for me because in my mistake, right? So I, yeah, so that ended where I, I found a different path forward, but, but I've had projects and where, um, and I podcasted about this last November during uh, Art Sound Off, but I made a, a utility called uh, It's My Party and it helped with managing invitations and surveys. Um, and uh, that, that, that sort of built to a point where it hit a limit. I was very, very attached to the project and wanted to see succeed, but I hit sort of like one more technical limitation. <laughs> and, and I thought there's only going to be more of this as it's in the, in the nutshell, it was how email, it functioned essentially as its own specialized email app, which is actually a, not a trivial problem to solve as I discovered by working on solving it. And the changing ways that vendors of servers and stuff and clients and whatever, it kept injecting so much chaos into my project. I was like, it's not like building a web page. There's, there's not as much standard control here. Uh, I'm really fighting a losing battle. So I've, I rejected the project by encountering that constraint that didn't happen to be someone else that was a decision maker. Mm, okay. Um, Anyway, that's, uh, so I, it depends on the source. And I think, you know, like being rejected by people is part of partially feels more personal. Uh, that one was hard, but it didn't feel as personal. Um, and, uh, yeah. 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 Because you're, you're in, in the situation where you're being rejected, you don't really have a whole lot of agency in that situation. But when you're saying no to something, even when it hurts, like it's like, wow, I really wanted this thing to succeed, but I'm deciding to pull the plug on this thing. Then, right, the, the, you still have like a sense of control, uh, autonomy, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and yeah. you do like still, no matter what, like if it's the project that you're making, you like you have the autonomy. It's just how do you feel about the thing and making it and where you want to go next? Yeah. And yeah. having some kind of, you know, willingness to uh, ask hard questions and, uh, and be honest. This reminds me of, uh, there's a phrase Tyler James uh, had said where 
Uh, sometimes like a gatekeeper wouldn't hire you, but you can hire yourself. And so do you, you're always hiring yourself for this to, to keep pushing on if you want to. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm also reminded of something. And I think this is like sort of tertiarily related to what we've been describing is I'm trying to like get in the mindset of my younger self. And when I was dealing with my first projections and how, how painful that was and how angry it made me. Um, and I think when I was first starting out, not having the context of like what this journey was going to look like, you know, it's like, I'm just going to make comics and then I'm just going to get paid to do it. That's all, you know, it's like, that's how my thinking was at, you know, the, the ripe old age of 18. Um, and so I remember like having the sense of, I want to be famous and I want to make, because that will, because then I can make lots of comics and lots of people will love them. Right. And now when I'm doing school visits, kids will ask, because this is the way I think a lot of young people think this is how I thought was they say like, are you famous? They always ask that question when I do school visits. And I'm like, well, like first let's look at what that means. What does it mean to be famous? And then we talk a little bit about it and I arrive at, well, I guess I want to be, but only to the extent that it gets me more interesting work. You know, it's like, I don't really need to be told by a million people that they love me. But if I am doing work that is connecting enough with people that more publishers or groups of people want to give me money to do this thing so I could do really cool work that I like doing, then yes, I would like to be, I would like to be famous. But, um, and I feel like that rejection thing too is like saying like, no, you don't, you don't, you don't deserve to do this thing. You don't get to do this thing. But then you go back to Tyler James who says like, nope, I'm going to hire myself to do this thing. So, and then like if I can get philosophical just for a second, Rob, like this is something that I think about a lot um, when making stuff. And we've talked about this probably a hundred times is that whole idea of like when you in set out to make a thing, there's going to be high points, low points. This is great. This is awesome. Oh no, this is hard. This is terrible. I'm terrible. And so on. Um, and I'm reminded, and I know a lot of essayists use this passage from The Lord of the Rings, but there's that scene in the book where Frodo and Sam are sitting in, what is, what's, what's the, the bad place? Mordor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they're, they're reminiscing on like, wow, this is like those adventure stories that people, you know, our, our dads read to us when we were little. And like, and uh, Frodo says, yeah, but if, if, if my dad were reading this part, I would say, please close the book. This is too scary. Right. And like, the idea there is that in anything that you do, there's going to be scary parts and there's going to be great parts. There's going to be exciting and energizing parts of making something where you feel like, oh my gosh, maybe I got that thing people call talent. And then there's going to be the parts where, you know, you're like, oh, I have no business holding a pencil or typing in a keypad or keyboard at all. And I'm going to cough both my hands. Um, but these two parts are part of the overall thing that we call making stuff, right? And to get a little Taoist, it's like, the exciting parts are made all the more exciting by contrast with the negative parts. Like they support each other and the negative parts are assuaged somewhat by, but yes, but it's also very exciting. Right. Uh, and I feel like this is something I've, I've only started to like really come to embrace as an idea is that loving something, whether it's a person or doing a thing, an endeavor, a vocation. Um, I feel like the love is incomplete if you only want the good stuff. Right. If it, you when you say I love this thing, you're also signing on for and I, and I don't mean to sound like I'm trying to glamorize pain here. Right. It's like, oh, the pain feels good. It makes me feel love. You know, it's more like <laughs> that's the new it, Nike shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love The Rock. I love Dwayne Johnson like as, as a celebrity and I like his movies and I think I, I follow him on Instagram. But like like some of the stuff he makes, he makes stuff like that where it's like, um, rent is due or something like that is like uh is like a t-shirt that he puts out there like just that urgency of like get out there and conquer you know it's like rock you're awesome and in watching you move is like watching physical poetry but man that that's a little too intense for my taste um <laughs> but yeah so like it's like this idea of like yes this hurts and i'm going to embrace this this and be present for this feeling of hurt and recognize the fact that this is part of the overall seasoning of this experience, which is a way of, I guess, like a squishier way of saying, like, this is a signal. This is something that this is information that will help me navigate through this thing. It's also an experience that is is worth having as part of the, the making of a thing. Um, if you put in your video game, you know, 
or booted up your video game and it was like you play for three seconds like you won it's like that's not a very good game <laughs> you know it's like i've been listening to a lot of um uh the boss keys series on youtube have you heard of this no um it's this guy who's like doing this. He's doing an analysis of. Oh, I'm a one note guy, Rob. It's an analysis of all the level designs in Metroid and how they designed it, like the different paths you take and whether or not, you know, like what's what's great about it, what's what's not so great about it. And one of the points he keeps coming back on is this idea of like, well, this wasn't very challenging, you know. In this particular version of the game, there's too many hints, and I just didn't feel the joy of success because I it was too easy to get there. Um. So, yeah, it's like that's kind of what we ask for in so much of our the things we participate in. So why would this be any different? And I think it's because we have I think it's because we have an innate sense that 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 struggle is part of what makes it meaningful. Yeah, right on. Like, I mean, that that entire uh, thought set of thoughts you unpacked, uh, I mean, I want to react a little bit, but like, I don't want to ruin it either because um, what you're describing. So I'm just going to go ahead and do what I do where I add a few things to your thoughts. Uh, you're describing, I think in a way like the, So the, the game aspect is we care about um, finding, let's see what, what's there's varieties of theories out there about games and psychology, but I'm trying to remember it was a competence uh, autonomy and uh, let's see and relatedness ca like car competence autonomy and relatedness and uh, when those work well in harmony we feel uh, like we're somewhere where we belong and our choices matter and we're doing useful stuff and I don't I think that totally relates to like you're pointing out like the general human experiences other great books about this uh, recommending uh, reality is broken by Jane McGonigal certainly worthwhile. Um, and also, uh, uh, by Kelly McGonigal, the, the upside of stress, which is another, um, angle on all this is part, especially talking about reframing and encountering difficult events Two great books to, to look into, but like you're pointing out the, the, like being a participant in that system, but also like the system itself, if you pull back and do some, um, thinking about how it works and how it functions like the boss key podcast or whatever you're there you face the challenge and it didn't go like how you expected but then it probably is meaningful if you're going to try to see how the whole system is working too like it's not just the data then how you see the data it's also how did that person who gave you the rejection see this and there's potentially a lot to a lot to learn there and 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 take more from it and then help you as far as where you go next yeah the uh yeah per finding a way to to uh, you're finding your own capacity to do perspective taking and explore the needs of others is going to um, make more out of the rejection i think that's good i think i think you just uh teed us up for final thought you want to take a break and then do final thought okay Let's do that. Okay, cool. All right. So in about uh, two minutes, we're going to conclude with some thoughts on moving forward after rejection happens, like what tools for moving forward, I should say. We did a lot of reframing, but it's like, okay, it's something some of my friends, some of my more anxious friends in my life will say to me when I'm like, I'll be like, oh man, that's really hard. And they're like, yeah, that's nice that you feel bad. Fix it. <laughs> so, okay. How, how, do you move, <laughs> how do you move forward? Um. So, but first we have to thank a couple more people who make this show possible. And those people happen to be us. We make this show possible. We make all sorts of things. And then in the engaging with the things, we find these topics to bring to the show every week. And the thing that I make that I hope you will check out is my comic, Boulder and Fleet, Mining for Trouble, which you can find on IndiePlanet.com. And what is it? It's a story about two best friends, a bear and a bird who decide to become adventurers together. Um, the bird wants to be very famous and successful. And as she sees things, that means conquering foes and winning battles. And the only problem is she teamed up with this bear who is very strong and very capable, but he hates fighting. And so they're, the adventures are often about the, the, the dynamic between those two characters trying to find their way to victory in their own ways, but then supporting each other at the same time. And it's a 92-page graphic novel that you can get at IndiePlanet.com. I think it's, oh, I should have really looked up the price before I started this ad spot. Uh, it's something around $16, and you can have it shipped to your door, full color. It is fun for 
I want to say all ages, but it's primarily aimed at young people. So if you have a young person in your life and you want them to explore a healthy story about examining what's the role of force in the world, Boulder and Fleet, Mining for Trouble at AnyPlanet.com. Rob, I'm going to launch the page with your game. Mm. That, and we can actually hear sounds from the game playing. You won't hear them, but the audience can. Uh, so we're looking at GuitarFighter.com. What's awesome. GuitarFighter.com? Thank you, Jersey. So yeah, I'll do a quick description. Yeah, Guitar Fighter is a game I made. Yeah, I started it nine years ago, but I've updated it a bunch of times. And uh, so yeah, it's it's and there's there's what's interesting is I've recently had it on sale for free. You might be like, oh rats, why am I learning about this now? It's no longer on sale for free. Uh, but it is pretty cheap. It's a, it's a couple bucks, and uh, it's available on a lot of platforms. And it's a it's a game all about making it. Um, making it fun, creating a little feedback loop of competence, autonomy, and relatedness uh, about learning the fret, the note positions on a guitar fretboard. And so you're doing this matchmaking with the, the notes on, on monsters' bellies, right? And then like, oh, if you miss, the monster takes a little bit of your health, right? So, so it's an arcadey experience, uh, really easy game to pick up. It's got a bunch of different modes. You can learn for four and five string bass, six and seven string guitar. Um, it's got custom tuning, so you can really make it you know morph to whatever you know whatever tuning you want so i mean honestly you can make the bass behave like an ukulele's you know a soprano ukulele if you want um someday given the signal that on the recent experiment i did uh like definitely a, a bunch of people now have guitar fretter <laughs> more people it, guitar fretter was sold very well speaking of luck and timing you know early days of, of mobile you know smartphone stuff but uh, but it's now I've been puzzling it out over the years and I don't know join in give throw throw the encouraging signal pick it up for a couple of bucks it's on uh, Android and and iOS and Windows and Mac and you can get links to all that stuff at guitarfretter.com guitarfretter.com and if you've already purchased the game giving it a review wherever you purchased it would be a really great way to help more people find it speaking of which if you're watching this video on Twitch or on YouTube giving it a thumbs up helps more people find the show if you're listening to the show in a podcatcher like uh, iTunes, uh, I forget what all the podcasters are called nowadays, but wherever you listen to the show in audio, giving us a five-star review helps more people find the show as well. And there's more things like this show at leanintoart.com slash workshops where you can download videos at a price of your choosing, even free. Okay. Um, are you ready to do final thought? Wait, why are you chuckling? <laughs> it's, it, it's, um, it, your uh, your wrap up of that was as if you were setting down a big box of rocks. <laughs> like, oh, uh, here, there you go. <laughs> Merry Christmas! <laughs> I just like stop out of the room. <laughs> All right, <laughs> All right. <laughs> exerted. You, that that was. But we're ready for one more push here for final thought. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> So, All right. So what do you got? Uh, well, th thinking about moving forward and really emphasizing that, I think we've talked lots about this and um, I really enjoyed all the, like your, your description in, in the prior section of, of this, this whole situation. And I mean, the, all of it too, like the process and how we get attached and what happens uh, then after the, the thresholds crossed and it didn't go like you expect, but then, I mean, here you are and moving forward is inevitable. Like, so, you know, yeah, st you, know, you, you stick around. Uh, we eventually don't feel as, as intense as we did, you know, initially, right? You described maybe there was a, uh, a big improvement in, in your mood, like after a couple hours, right? That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, it, it, something that helps, I think, in, the, in, that, in that time of, of, of moving, moving on. Um, how really asking yourself, how are you looking at this? Is this, is this the, the framing is a big deal? Like what about this is meaningful to you? Be explicit about that. And as opposed to like, I, I think, um, I know I'm, I'm guilty of this where, where it's like, yeah, general annoyance or frustration. It's meaningful. Let's move on. It's like, it's meaningful because why? So that'll be helpful. Yeah. Specific. Yeah, because otherwise it just becomes a chant, right? It's like yeah. uh, you're just it, making it, Nike shirts all the time, <laughs> you know. Yep, gobble the pain. Gobble the pain. 
Yep. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's it's fine. Those shirts are fun. Those shirts are fun. I, and yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I like the spirit. I like characters. I like being among characters and sometimes being that character who is like, let's go, everybody. Come on. We can do this. Confidence sure. and energy. Come on. And we, you know, nothing will happen if we don't try and we're going to try whatever. I, I, I've been that character. Yep. And I've been with characters like that, whatever. And so, yay. But also ask that character to, you know, find that's like pointing at the, that's pointing at meaning. That's not finding out what it is. So, so go all the way there. Yep. To, to help with framing. 100%. So, so the, to, to summarize that you're just, you're saying define the meaning or find words for the, like what the meaning is when you say this is meaningful. Well, what meaning, what makes it meaningful? Characterize it, have, have some kind of picture in your head of what it is that you're doing this for. Because that by having that, you've gone from just seeing it through a, the pain, the, the painful, like this is um, rejection. And now, and I feel all these feels about it. And it's, there's more to it. And of course, there's po- tons of, of privilege and assumption and me saying this and everyone's got a different makeup and background and the circumstance that brings you and makes you up and all that stuff in this circumstance and what you need personally to move forward, what have you. It's a broad brush to say even that, to say, um, you know, framing things uh, is useful to get it. So, so go, you go from the negative framing to something that at least makes the, the negative worth it and, and important. And uh, yeah, so I don't know, not to, not to say it's easy, but, um, and, and that it works the same for everybody, but overall, mm-hmm. yeah, the idea of finding framing through the meaning uh, is, is a big part. And, whoops. Yeah. How about you, Jersey? It- uh, well, I noticed that you also had in this list, uh, fun, you know, um, a great way to remind oneself, at least I found a way to remind myself that I am not the work is to sometimes force myself to go out and have a good time <laughs> and remind myself that there's like, there's, there's, um, there's real value to play. Right. And I mean, there's been lots of researchers talking about this, um, Brene Brown is one of those people who talks about like how play, how important play is in our lives. And, uh, you know, like we've talked in the past about like, oh, I'll just go for a walk. And then like my brain sorts out the problems. Well, also like full disengagement from the work. Like actually, like I'm going to go to a baseball game and I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to have, you know, a veggie hot dog and a cold beer and watch young men try valiantly to hit this little white ball out of the park, you know? Uh, and get really, really wrapped up in that in that uh, battle, and forget my own, you know, like recharge my own batteries by letting that stuff off the burner for a while. Um, it, it's it's. Uh, I feel very guilty of being very um, limited in what my interests are. And being very proud of that, right? I like I like comics, I like telling stories, and I like cartoons, and I like the people who do those things. And that's my world, and that's the only place I want to exist. And and I do. I feel very, very... You've seen me. <laughs> how many years have you been coming to the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival? You've seen me in that element. You know You know how... Like, it's, it's very joyful for me. But um, that's not all of me. And having fun is a great way to remind yourself that there's more to you than this definition you've constructed for yourself. That's so awesome. I agree. And, and, uh, and along the way, while you're having fun, connecting with others and, and, uh, and really caring about their experience, right? So go connect with your, connect with your community, whoever that is. If, they're, if it's friends, if it's the, um, just people next to you at an event, that's great. Um, yeah. this, it, it helps you get out of your own Get out of get out of your own head. So at some point, when you end up you end up coming back to like, well, I still have this event to deal with. Uh, hopefully, you're in a in a in a better place. Yeah, cool. I think as you pointed out earlier in this episode, we walked around it. I think we <laughs> we did. Well, 
walked around the elephant of the topic and identified all of its parts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the, the poetic closure, Jersey. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Rob, for this discussion and uh, for, you know, helping with all of the setup to get this working on Twitch. We'll see how people react to this and see how we feel about it after the fact. But um, this is the part where I say we record the show every week. We stream it live someplace. Tune into our uh, social media, Lena Tart on Twitter to find out where we're going to be next. Uh, and we collect, we, you know, we stream it as a video. We put the video on YouTube and then we collect the podcast at patreon.com slash lean into art. I will be back soon. We'll both be back soon. Um, until then I have been Jersey Drozd of lean into art.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of lean into art.com and I'm Rob Stenzinger on Instagram and Twitch. <laughs> Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.